Hello and welcome to this, the fifth episode of Here's the Thing. Is that right? It is right. All eight minute I, I, movies, maybe. All eight minute movies. Yeah. I, I really lost confidence the, immediately after saying it. I was, yeah. I was opening bold and then I chickened out. Um, yes, that's the name. We literally just discussed this. We, we're sticking with the intro. Uh, <laughs> I, I like it. Um, it's called Here's the Thing, colon, eight minute movies. The colon is silent so to speak <laughs> and possibly inverted <laughs> <laughs> oh oh god we've done such a good job we're not even two minutes in mm. uh, uh, let's introduce ourselves because we forget to do it constantly hello i'm kieran and i'm peter there, there we go they know our names now <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is a really angry start to a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the thing to do. Alienate your audience immediately. We're furious that we have to do this, even though we put this task on ourselves. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very angry now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. How are you doing, Peter? I'm just angry. Yeah, no, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm all right, you know. Well, that's good to hear. I too am fine. Thanks for asking. Mm. <laughs> uh, sorry, but in the discussion before, you just said that you asked me how I'm doing. You didn't say it was to be the other way around. <laughs> like, so, uh, that... <laughs> that is true, and I did specify that you can't improvise on the script. So, uh, yeah. so there we are. Yeah. Right, that's two of the things on my checklist done. Uh, let's introduce the concept like we do every time. You did it last time. So this time I will say words <laughs> reluctantly. All right. I like the film The Thing, like possibly too much. So I decided to force a friend of mine who doesn't like The Thing exactly as much as I do to watch it in laborious detail in tiny chunks and then talk at great length about those little chunks and in the end perhaps profit do people make money from podcasts uh well it's very variable but i think the average answer is no mm. so um so you're telling me we're not likely to be sponsored by skillshare then um I should, I should cut that out. We don't want to alienate a potential in, <laughs> a potential sponsor. We love you, Skillshare. Yeah, oh, Skillshare is great. I've certainly heard of that website. <laughs> I think we get retrospectively paid for this. <laughs> oh, I think that's demanding money with menaces, isn't it? I mean, if we, if we, <laughs> we, make, a, make a note, Peter. We're going to have to look into how sponsorship works before the yes. next podcast. We've sponsored you, or you've sponsored us, one or the other, whether you like it or not. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we're going to get very far with the concept of non-consensual sponsorship. It really does, does sort of feel like robbery. <laughs> oh, four minutes in, and I wish I was dead. <laughs> All right, well, so you see, I don't really need to ask you how you are because it just emerges through the course of the podcast. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, all right, this is the section that's definitely always been called Let's Talk About the Thing. And that's not a name I thought up this afternoon while writing it. It's it's the bit of the podcast where we talk about something that isn't the main meat of the podcast. Oh, we're back on podcast meat again. Mm. But it's a bit of a weird name for it, I have to say, because um, when we move on from that, let's talk about the thing, we then go on to talk about the thing. Yeah, and maybe we should have workshopped that name a little more, actually, <laughs> thinking about it. Let's not talk about the thing sounds like a weird section for a podcast, which isn't which is about the thing. I can't even get through a sentence. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should just name both segments. Let's talk about the thing, but use different intonation. <laughs> oh God, this is going to turn into that thing. Uh, what is it? I didn't say she stole my, Oh God, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say she stole my money. You know, that, uh, that sentence that you can put the inflection on every word in for a different meaning. Thanks. Yeah. English language. 
let's talk about the thing. <laughs> to explain the bell for a second, just in case you've just joined us. <laughs> In the, for some like, reason. I, can't, I can't imagine anything less comprehensible than joining this madness in the middle of it. <laughs> Is that we have a little game that we play where we each have a bell, and if someone says the words the thing outside, and that does not count, I see you looking for the bell there. <laughs> I hit it, but it didn't work. I had a bell malfunction. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if some if someone says uh, the thing outside of the context of talking about the monster in the movie known as the thing, uh, or the film called the thing, then we are allowed to ding the bell. Um, and, and I think uh, we should add to that: we are also allowed to say the words "the thing" if we are talking about the rules of the game that we invented. Yeah, all right, that seems fair enough to me. All right, remembering, of course, that if we accumulate more than five dings per person uh, over the course of the entire podcast, we will no longer go to heaven. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Where were we? <laughs> <laughs> um, you were just introducing the uh, segment called "Let's Talk About the Thing," in which we don't talk about the film "The Thing." I yeah yeah no sorry you you've said it wrong. It's "Let's Talk About the Thing." All <laughs> oh, right, okay. <laughs> oh, I'm never going to remember to put a different stress on each one of those. Oh, all right, God, <laughs> let's talk about the prequel film. The prequel film is confusingly also called The Thing. Mm. It came out in the year 2011, uh, and it's a prequel to the 1982 film, you know, the one that we're laboriously discussing. And it focuses on the events that transpire at the Norwegian camp. Interestingly, the film has a female protagonist, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, playing Kate Lloyd, an American paleontologist brought in to help investigate the creature in the ice. The film also adds some American characters to the Norwegian Tula station, presumably so we don't have to watch the entire film in Norwegian with subtitles. I feel like they could have just hunt for Red October, did it? <laughs> uh, do you, that's, an, that's an interesting... Do you think that would work with a an audience these days? Or if it's too clearly a, a trope that takes you out of the movie? I mean, it's clearly a, a device, I guess, but I don't know. I feel like it's fine. Like, it happens, and you're like, oh, that's a choice and then you kind of forget about it i i don't know i don't know if i agree i think i i think if they tried to do that these days they'd have a lot more trouble getting away with it hmm. Maybe. i mean it, it does it does work in the hunt for red october it's a really excellent scene where they transition from russian to english i wonder how accurate sean connery's russian accent is in yeah. russian <laughs> no, i wouldn't put like any rubles on that Back to let's talk about the thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do it. I need to stop. Uh, um, Amalgamated Dynamics, also known as Studio ADI, were brought on to do the physical effects because they have a lot of physical effects. And I think we touched on this before that I think that the best way to do effects now in films is to have a physical effect and paint over it with CGI to cover the gaps, which is what they originally intended. Mm-hmm. Now, the film was a commercial flop, grossing only $32 million against a $38 million budget with mixed reviews from critics. Uh, there's a lot of talk online of trouble with like reshoots, replacing physical shots with CGI under very short timetables. You probably make a podcast out of just the problems with the thing's production to be honest studio adi the um special effects company was sort of so incensed by the treatment of their physical effects in that film that they went on to make their own practical effects only sci-fi film called harbinger down and um yeah it's it's actually quite good the effects are brilliant i i can't help but feel like it could have used a little more writing though like <laughs> uh, no it, it is good it, it is good um i would say it's about on a par with the thing the 2011 film oh boy <laughs> i'm gonna <laughs> wait just wait till i get the thing about the name interestingly the film actually has two recorded endings uh the original one where she encounters the dead pilot of the craft and a room full of broken pods 
suggesting that the aliens on the spacecraft were collecting zoological exhibits and that the thing had escaped. And that's what caused the saucer to crash. And uh, they actually used theatrical ending, which is also known as the Tetris ending, uh, where the pilot is digitally painted over with special effects, which many people are not thrilled by. <laughs> the pod room isn't shown in that version as well. Uh, things I personally consider good points about the prequel. Uh, it's visually very similar to The Thing, 1982. Uh, they did an excellent job copying the ambience, and um, the Norwegian base has a very strong visual similarity to that shown in the earlier film. Uh, I like that they came up with their own version of the blood test, which you know we'll get to later, but obviously you remember. They, they check each other for fillings, um, as The Thing can't copy inorganic parts. Mm. It, it's good, but not nearly as iconic as sampling their blood. Yeah. I remember that and very few other things about this film that I've maybe seen once. Mm. Mm. Uh, things I consider bad points, strap in. <laughs> 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 All the best elements of the movie are kind of aping the earlier film, like the blood test scenes, finding the UFO. I mean, these are just things which were taken from the original and mixed up a little bit. Mm -hmm. In trying to duplicate the ending, it contradicts the original, because at the ending of the prequel, they are in a snowcat, need quite know the UFO, and they burn one of them, and she's in another one, so why don't they see that when they fly over the UFO? And finally, the name strongly irritates me, because now when you're talking about the thing, you have to specify a year afterwards, because otherwise, people don't know which of the two you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it, it's a, it is an especially confusing choice because it's it's not like a, a reboot it's not like a, a a remake it's a um it's a film that is supposed to be a direct prequel yeah exactly exactly yeah. and uh one of the um working titles for it was the thing from another world which you know while that would conflict with the 1951 film mm -hmm. <laughs> it at least would make talking about The Thing and its prequel easier. The obvious choice, of course, is uh, The Thing minus one. <laughs> too Thing, Too Furious. <laughs> oh, I actually quite like that one. <laughs> um, the Rotten Tomatoes consensus for the film is... It serves the bare serviceable minimum for a horror film, but the thing is all boo scares and a slave to the far superior John Carpenter version, which is an opinion I'm inclined to agree with. It's not a bad film by any means, uh, but it's just deeply confused as to whether it's a prequel or a reboot. Yeah, I have sort of half watched this, I think it's fair to say. I haven't really concentrated on it in the way that I have once or twice uh, for the 1982 film and I don't remember very much about it I remember the, about the fillings and I remember at some point there is a problem on a helicopter I believe um, uh, and I remember the, the climax point of the film towards the end I think they go into the UFO, I think. Yeah, that, that's right. right. Yep. Yeah, but I, I don't <laughs> remember very much about it at all, apart from those things. I um, I, I actually think I dragged you to see it, um, <laughs> if I'm remembering correctly. I don't... Th I think I only saw it um, around your house. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's probably also the case. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I saw it around your house, because I seemed... I, I don't remember what your uh, initial reaction was to it, but I feel like when you first saw the film, you were like, it didn't ruin it, was your basic opinion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, yeah, I think that's pretty much my opinion it has remained steady, that, it, you know, it's it's an alright film. It's a, it's a 6 out of 10 sci-fi horror film. Yeah. But the problem is... In a world where a far superior version of a film exists, why would you watch the less good one of the two? Yeah, I I, th I think that your that your opinion on it has kind of got worse over time as you've just kind of had time to consider it and think about it a bit more. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably. Yeah. Uh, okay, so n now we're done with that section. We will never name again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
I'm going to answer your questions from last time that I didn't immediately have answers for. Uh, this section is not named well either. <laughs> The main question you had was, uh, what makes the noise of the thing? Uh, mm. And that was a very good question, because in researching that, I found the blog of Stuart Cohen, the producer, who recounts a lot of relevant stuff for the scene we were watching previously. For monster sounds, they followed the method that the legendary sound engineer Murray Spivak used on King Kong, combining animal sounds, changing the pitch, slowing them down, speeding them up, running them backwards until they found something that they really liked via trial and error. Mm. The dog thing that we saw in the previous eight minutes uses bird calls and a pig squeal all heavily processed together. Hmm. And um, do you remember the section where they're all the men are approaching the cage and there's a sort of low droning noise in the background that gets steadily more intense as they get closer? Yes. That's the noise of an air conditioner humming, which has just been processed and then increased in volume. Nice. But they found the scene was quite flat without it with them just approaching. So just adding any audio effect to it really improved it. Okay. Um, you didn't have any other questions last time, so now it's time to get into the show. Yeah. And what we like to call, let's talk about the thing. No, it's not called that. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about the thing. Yeah. <laughs> going to sound like one of those automated f call systems by the end of this <laughs> if you want to talk about the thing press one <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, actually my voicemail um. <laughs> <Yeah>. it is <laughs> um, as is written in the scrolls of podcast um now we will review some of your stances that's not right whatever from, from, from the end of the last episode <laughs> congratulations for saying that in the most oblique weird way possible <laughs> uh, i at the end of the last episode i asked you what you think happened next uh, yes, uh, and I eventually, with a bit of nudging, which I'm I, I'm annoyed about that I had needed the nudging now because I, afterwards yeah, that, I that that's it, no more nudges. You're you're out of hints. Uh, afterwards, I remember that they they do indeed flamethrower thing, but I remembered a few bits about it a little bit wrongly. So I'm going to say that I get uh, like some marks for this, but not full marks for this. Yeah, all right. I'm the person who hands out points around here. <laughs> they do. Um, uh, flame throw the thing, but it's Childs that does the flame throwing, which I did not remember. Also, I got confused about the scuttling through the ceiling because I sort of thought I remembered the thing scuttling through the ceiling, uh, but also I had a memory of uh, it being flame thrown in the room and. <laughs> I'm not sure that's how you conjugate that. Well, I'm not going to say flame through. <laughs> <laughs> flame throwered, maybe? Yeah, sure. <laughs> that's, that's that's the best of a bad bunch, I think. Yeah. Uh yeah, I saw uh, I remembered it being flame throwered in the room uh, and uh I, and I thought well both things can't be true but they kind of were it's because of the way it's been shot i think we'll get to mm, yes and uh the second of your stances <laughs> i've used that word and i'm sticking with it who's infected so you said uh norris was definitely mm -hmm. infected uh who's not infected uh clark Mm. Uh, I thought that was interesting, but then I remembered we uh, we spoke a bit about how he definitely goes back for the thing. <laughs> oh, God, yes. Uh, all right. Uh, and you, I don't know why, but I've written down here, hard maybe, Bennings. <laughs> What's a hard maybe? Uh, uh, it, it's, I think that it. we're yeah, at you... the point in the film where it's getting close to... Uh, uh, Bennings being a goner. Yeah, you are, uh, you are you are counting down the seconds until George Bennings is dead, right? <laughs> uh, and so it's got to happen soon if it hasn't happened already. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, you're uh, you're going to kick yourself when we get to that bit, honestly. Uh, am I? 
Yeah, you really. Are. I can't. T- I can't. Uh, is it because of the, is it because of the flamethrower? I I I will say right, nothing. Okay. I'm... <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, I don't know about Clark now. Um, I don't think. I still don't think that he is the one uh, that that we saw the dog walk into the room with. No, um, that's true. Uh, because as we know, uh, Clark always wears a hat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Clark's hat is gonna probably glued on. Um, and... <laughs> All right, calm down, Poirot. I don't remember any scene where Clark is not wearing that hat, but put it that way. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, the silhouette did not have a hat. <laughs> so that's all I'm going that's, with. Here. That's that's your reasoning. Okay, well, you yeah. know, it's not the most specious reasoning in the world, but it's not fucking far from it. It's not great, I'll, <laughs> I'll admit. Um, so and- I don't... Uh, so I still think that that was um, who did I say? Um, I still think that was Norris, uh, but uh, Clark. Uh, see, here's my thing, and we had a bit of a conversation about this last time. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's my thing. It's a different section from this podcast that yeah. we're not we're not allowed to air. If uh, so he gives an answer that uh, he has been alone with the dog about an hour. I think you're getting into what happens in the next sequence, which is not what this part of the podcast is about. You're right. Yeah. You're right. And of course, the um, the remaining three people on your mystery list are Fuchs, Windows and Knowles. You just don't know anything about them at that point. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's too hard to tell. Well, with that set up let's get into the show i was gonna say the meat of the podcast again but i really want to get away from podcast meat analogies Mm. okay well well, watch along with us at home minutes 32 to 40 of the thing don't don't do that don't do it As is usual, I am going to read out a little section header for whatever's happening in that 20 to 30 seconds of action. And if there's anything you want to comment, chip in, or I will chip in. Otherwise, I'll keep going and just be talking to myself. Let's begin. The monster tries to climb through the hole in the roof. Now, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but it's really interesting the way this scene is cut together because... Mm. It definitely seems like the thing escapes through the roof, like there are two things in this shot. And I always kind of thought that was what was happening until I watched it a little bit closer. And you can see that it it punches a hole into the roof. It squeedly leels up into the air and then then it gets killed and falls back down to the ground. Right. Yeah, I think the the second time that we watched this, I could sort of see the sequence of events and what was happening there. But uh, yeah, the first time and in, in previous times, I think as well, when I've seen this, it does seem like something escapes. But as you said, that that wouldn't really make sense. They'd be really worried uh-huh. at the fact that a monster had jumped through the roof and run away. Yes. Uh, so uh, I think in my head, I was confusing my memory of seeing the thing escape through the roof uh, and my memory of seeing th- something get flamethrowered in the um in the room and i so i I was having trouble remembering exactly what happened next because i didn't think both things happened but as it turns out doesn't quite escape through the roof yeah it's a nice try but no cigar child arrives with the flamethrower and is stunned by the sight of the thing we got keith david properly featured here for the first time as child's Jeffrey Holder, Carl Weathers, Isaac Hayes, and Bernie Casey were all considered uh, for the role of Charles, with Ernie Hudson, perhaps best known to us as Winston Zeddemore from Ghostbusters, being in the lead-up until they interviewed Keith Davids and decided that he was their man. This role as Charles was the first credited feature film role for Keith David. It launched his very prolific career that continues even now, more than 35 years later. The Thing attempts to attack him by launching a tendril at him. Rob Bettine called this special effect the pissed-off cabbage. Um, oh, why? <laughs> because it sort of looks like an angry cabbage. Hmm. The petals that open up um, as it flies towards him are 12 rubber dog tongues, complete with rows of teeth along the edges. Weird. You know, it's learning from our biology. 
child sets it on fire with the flamethrower. Ah, the flamethrower. Uh, this was the first time they'd used the real flamethrower on set. Um, they had two flamethrowers, a non-working replica and a functional one. Everyone was very nervous because they couldn't get out of the way if something went wrong. And as we've discussed, that's uh, two more flamethrowers than you'd actually find on an Antarctic base. <laughs> yeah, quite. Um the flamethrower is an army M2A17, which was used by American troops during the Vietnam War for defoliage. Defoli defor defol is that right? Defoliage? Um defoliage. Exfoliating. <laughs> <laughs> the men put out the fire and look at the gruesome body. So there's more of those patented uh, lingering horrified looks here, like we saw in the last few episodes. Yeah, I, I, I do have a comment soon. <laughs> I, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's fine. It it can just be me talking forever. <laughs> I I I like the idea of a podcast where I just lecture at you endlessly about the thing. I just go, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe I could just record like a whole bunch of times of you saying, yeah, mm, oh, that's very interesting here, and and then I can that's just, quite, yeah, fascinating. <laughs> I've never heard you say that before. <laughs> and other lies. <laughs> you know what? You are a clever chap. <laughs> <laughs> You've said it now. I'm going to cut in. <laughs> <clears throat> Where were we? <laughs> Blair performs an autopsy of the dog thing. With, like, very short gloves on, as we remarked when <laughs> we were watching it. Yeah, I uh he is balls deep in that thing. I I would not be near that without gloves like well over my shoulders. Yeah, That's... I I used longer gloves than that to do the washing up and yeah, yeah. like <laughs> I I have gloves twice the length of that for scrubbing the barbecue. So, you know, mm. Blair, up your glove game, man. It's 2020, yeah. well, it's 1982, but whatever. <laughs> um so <laughs> I actually mentioned in an earlier episode that uh, Donald Pleasance was often a favorite of Carpenter's, and I wondered why he wasn't in the thing. And it turns out he was the original choice for the character of Blair, um, but he wasn't able to perform because of a scheduling conflict. Mm. Wilford Brimley was cast as Blair because they wanted an everyman whose absence wouldn't be questioned by the audience, suggesting that he will be absent shortly. I want to keep an eye out for that one. You know, this whole stuff with the autopsy uh, and similar to the scene in the last segment as well i just feel like i find it way more gross than any of the stuff with the actual living thing in it um really that's interesting yeah i find it way more uncomfortable to deal with i think you, you know i think it's because everything that i'm a little bit squeamish about has some sort of tactile element to it i think uh and actually like a tactile element and kind of smells elements to it too um like i'm really uncomfortable with mold uh and i'm really uncomfortable with like touching anything that i find creepy like uh, like i i don't like i can look at a spider from a distance and be sort of okay but if i think i might have to touch the spider i'm very uncomfortable but then if i kind of deck myself out in like gloves and stuff that's going to prevent me from touching the spider i can like much more easily deal with it so i think just watching someone just dig deep into a gross thing is very un uncomfortable to me in comparison with just a spooky monster you know, you've genuinely given me a few things I've never really thought about <laughs> during this film at all. Like, I do not like squishy jelly things. Um, touching them, uh, pretty grim. Um, my my go-to example is that sort of weird jelly that, they, that surrounds pork pies. Why is it there? Why isn't it anywhere fucking else than inside something <laughs> delicious? Like, why, why can't we take that jelly and fire it at the fucking moon? Um... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah yeah what do you think the thing smells like i've never Probably thought about gross. that before yeah I, I i can't imagine it's great but like it's it's got to smell sort of meaty right 
<laughs> I mean, maybe. Uh, look, if you're suggesting it smells delicious, no, um, no, I'm not. <laughs> it smells like a roast dinner. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of those trap things. It puts out like a fresh linen scent to draw you in. <laughs> it smells like a Glade plug-in. You yeah, know, it's fucking it. awful. Well, I suppose we're talking about its default smell before it imitates. There's no discernible imitation smell, I would assume. <laughs> no, that that's true. I <laughs> It would be a very different film if they all smelt like lavender or something. Yeah. They smell like old grandmothers. Very difficult to get across in film as well. <laughs> Oh dear. Oh, what does the thing smell like dot com? <laughs> <laughs> the monster here that he's attacking away at is like an onion. It's a solid resin model in the core, covered with a foam rubber skin that he's cutting through. Apparently, um these were his favorite scenes to film. Oh, remembering, of course, from last time that we discussed how he was a ranch hand and a cowboy, it's probably less squeamish about this whole thing than we are. I bet Wilford Brimley, while he was alive, loved a pork pie. Yeah, probably. Yep. Especially that squishy gel bit. Yeah, oh yeah, he's fucking nuts. For... <laughs> Is this talking bad about the dead? I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> I'll, I will contact the estate of Wilford Brimley and, and ask what his stance on pork pie jelly is. I will not do that. You, will, you won't. No. I, will, I will not. No, I will not. I, I, I feel like that would be more disrespectful, <laughs> if anything. I I apologize unreservedly. I, I just going to waste the time of his estate. <laughs> uh, were he still alive, he would have answered that question on Twitter. He's even like a great guy. Mm. Do American pork pies have weird gross jelly? We are getting so off topic. <laughs> I once had a pork pie confiscated when I went to America. No, no, we can't go. Like, <laughs> No, I'm sorry. No, I, I need to hear that story. Um, it was just at the airport. I didn't realize. It, I was quite young. Uh, I'd gone to America, and um, on the flight, I had uh, my mum had packed me a pork pie um, in my hand luggage. Right. Uh, and I didn't eat it. I just uh, I, I just took it with me. And through security on the other end, they uh, it took the pork pie away from me, and I was bewildered. I, <laughs> Was it was it destroyed in a controlled explosion? <laughs> I can only assume so. <laughs> oh dear. Where were we before we spoke about pork pies? Uh, I think we we're talking about uh, Wilford Brimley's estate. Oh no! Um, stop it. <laughs> <clears throat> Blair discusses the assimilation process with the men. So. Uh, this scene was originally a lot shorter, but it got expanded upon because they found it very hard to explain the life cycle of the thing to the audience, even though it seems quite simple. Hmm. I, I, I did think when I was watching this, I mean, it's done quite well, but it, it, I did think this is an explanation for the benefit of the audience when I was watching it. Yeah, um, there were a lot of rewrites up on the set in British Columbia, and they kept having to try to come up with new ways to explain the thing and its life cycle to people. Yeah. Later, Clark and Blair talk about the Norwegian Husky. Blair mistrusts Clark because he was alone with the dog. <sighs> but do I mistrust Clark? That's the question. Um, <laughs> it really is. <laughs> so, an hour is a long time, but if he is the thing he could be lying about the hour but if he is the thing why would he say an hour then why wouldn't he say oh i just kind of for, saw for, him for, 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 for like a minute like definitely not enough time to become the thing that's for sure <laughs> but b- previously you said that they don't necessarily act in their own interest when they are imitating so i don't know I, I'm not sure if I'm giving you the correct sort of impression of what uh, of what the imitations would do, really. I mean, I, I think that they would definitely lie if it benefited them. Mm. Um, in the script, the reason he's alone with the dog for so long is that um, the dog has been hit by one of the Norwegian bullets, um, mm. and had they, he had to perform light surgery to correct it. Right. Um, like you know, he's not a, he's a dog handler, so all he's doing is really taking the bullet out and like 
stitching it back up. Yeah. Um, but that's the reason he's alone with the dog for an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. In the film, I think it's a little less clear as to why he would be alone with the dog. But then again, if he uh, if he was alone with the dog, uh, and for that long, why wouldn't the thing have attacked? Um, I think it's because it's in an entirely new environment, and it, how does it know that he's going to remain alone with it for the hour that it needs to, you know, take so him over? It's just being cautious. I yeah, think it's okay. biding its time. That's that's a, definitely a thing that we see time and again throughout the film is that it will bide its time. Like it mm. won't, it won't strike until it's absolutely certain of assimilation or kind of backed into a corner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I think on that basis, I think that Clark is not infected yet. He is telling the truth. He was with the dog for about an hour. I think if he was uh, imitation, then he would have said like a time that was less than loads of time. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, and that probably would have been fine. Um so yeah, that that's what I'm going with. Clark not infected at this point. All right. Well, remember that for the end when I'll ask you that question. Yeah. The men watch the recovered video footage from the Norwegians. I just want to say here that in the book, uh, they have to convert the video from PAL to NTSC before they can watch it, which is something I imagine was left out here for dramatic license. <laughs> okay. My my favorite bit of any film is where they have to awkwardly mess around with um, video formats in, in order to watch a videotape they've found. Just watch it slightly too fast or slow, or I don't remember which way around it is. Um, <laughs> um, PAL is 60 hertz and NTSC is 50, I think. I can't, I don't know. Right in. Yeah, it would, it would slow down because... Uh, Video games on the original Nintendo are always slower over here because they're a pal, I think. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you sound confident, no one will check. But the the thing that struck me about this part, actually, was that if it were me... Well, yeah, hmm. <laughs> it, it, I don't know how much of this footage they were supposed to have watched um, prior to us joining this scene. Uh, but it, it, I get the impression. I, I got the impression that it was not very much. Um, and I don't know if it were me. I feel like I'd be more interested in nine hours of footage from a base that explodes and something goes incredibly horribly wrong, in and think that maybe I might be able to learn something from, uh, from it. They're very dismissive of their chances of discovering anything in nine hours of footage quite early on. That's a that's an interesting point you raise, uh, and perhaps the person who's saying that oh, maybe we shouldn't watch all that footage um, has some sort of ulterior motive for saying it. Who is saying that, actually? <laughs> uh, interestingly enough, it's Bennings who says that we can't learn anything at all from this. Ah, mm. well, isn't that fascinating? <laughs> you <laughs> shifty little Bennings! <laughs> They see the Norwegians find the UFO in the ice. Fun fact, John Carpenter is one of the people there as the Norwegians as a cameo. That is a fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> MacReady, Palmer, and Norris fly to investigate the UFO. I'm a little bit nervous about what's coming up because I know that later you've got to ask me what happens next. and I had literally no memory of the part where they fly out to the UFO. It's an interesting little sequence, this one. First of all, the, the Ennio Morricone score is picking up here again. Um, did you know that his score for this film was nominated for a Razzie Award for Worst Score? You might have mentioned. Did you mention that before? I, I think you might have mentioned it before. Mm. I, I disagree, but... <laughs> yeah, I, I disagree as well. Well, anyway, it didn't win. It lost out to Mike Brady and Peter Sullivan from The Pirate Movie, which is a film I've never actually heard of. Mm. Be interesting to hear that soundtrack and see <laughs> how bad it is. Apparently, Although, it's, become, it's become a cult classic, so presumably somewhere else there are two people recording a podcast going through eight minutes of time going, well, you know, it's much better than the thing. I think the soundtrack's underrated, actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I don't know. I, I had my whole theory of when there's orchestral music, the thing is not here, um, didn't I? But we've got Norris here. 
Um, I'm going to tell you uh, that the three people in the helicopter are McCready, Norris, and Palmer, because a lot of people have trouble recognizing that it's Palmer because of how heavily he's dressed. Mm. Um, and obviously, for a lot of the shots, it isn't actually him. This scene cuts a lot between second unit photography, which is lookalikes for the main cast, on location cast, and on set cast. Mm. So you can't entirely tell who someone is when they're outside because they're probably being played by someone who isn't them unless you can definitely see their face. Yeah. I uh, The only reason I knew it was Norris there was because of the the conversation on the spaceship. Yeah, uh, yeah. A lot of people do have trouble realizing who the third person is because you never really see his face. Yeah, I wasn't sure. A lot of the shots coming up are all map paintings. Uh, Albert Whitlock did the various map paintings of the UFO in the ground, which let them do stuff at a scale which was impossible for them. They're fairly convincing, I thought. They are very good map paintings. I think map painting might be a lost art now, but it is... I think it still has a place. I don't know. They climb down to get a closer look. Uh, it's not actually the cast climbing down there. It's just the lookalikes. Remembering, of course, that the lookalike for Kurt Russell is going to be Dick Warlock. What oh. a name. <laughs> 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 Norris thinks that it's been buried in the ice for 100,000 years. Uh, Norris mentions that the backscatter effect has been bringing up things out of the ice, and the ice it's buried in is at least 100,000 years old. Would you like to know what the backscatter effect is? I, I can sort of imagine, but tell me how it works. Um, I also would like to know what it is, because I don't think it's a real thing. Um, if it is, it certainly doesn't use the term the backscatter effect. So it's not a real effect? I don't think it's a real thing. I, I think what they're trying to get across is that the ice kind of bubbles up to the surface, but I don't know. I'm I'm not a geologist. Uh... <laughs> yeah, the, the backscatter effect. Maybe maybe this is because Norris is the thing, and <laughs> it's just like okay, right. Let's just make something uh, plausibly geological. <laughs> let's just make up a phrase, uh, and maybe there are actually gaps in his geology knowledge. Maybe the assimilation is not a hundred percent perfect. And he's like, uh, shit, make something up. Backscatter effect. Yeah, that sounds good. Do you know that's that is an excellent justification for them just making something up on the fly to <laughs> something convincing sounding. Yeah. Yeah, the only the only thing I can find about backscatter and Antarctic ice is um measuring it from space with lasers, not lasers, you know, like sky beams. <laughs> I I enjoy in this podcast tonight, which is apparently me having a breakdown in real time. Um <laughs> I'm not gonna correct sky beams, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Things do appear close to the surface of ice occasionally, right? That's a thing. Uh. I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I I think they do. I mean, it sounds plausible to me. You know, I I took the backscatter effect as being a thing. Um, you know, as read as oh fuck. <laughs> I took the backscatter effect as being a real phenomenon for all this time, uh, and it turns out that I I don't think it is. Oh, well, never mind. A distance from the UFO site, they find a missing shape cut out from the ice. It's pretty clear, I think, what this shape is. I don't think there's any mystery there. Uh, No, indeed, it does fit the dimensions of the mysterious ice cube we saw earlier at the Norwegian station. This shot where they approach the ice hole is the famous shot filmed on the Universal Backlot. The entire thing is a map painting. Helicopter, crashed UFO, hole in the ice. The only real element is the men approaching it. You couldn't tell, did you? I, I couldn't, no. It's very well done. Uh, we cut to a close-up here. And um, do you like the map painting of the hole in the ice that they cut to there? Yeah, I, I was completely convinced by all of that. I'm sorry, I'm rusing you. That last bit is not a map painting. It, it's an actual hole dug into the ground near their location for me. Hmm. The, ice okay. gets bluer as the, the ice gets bluer the further you go down, which is not a thing I knew about ice. Yeah, that brings us to the end of this little eight-minute segment. This is the first time that we've sort of... It's been really interrupted because we end mid-dramatic sting, which I found really annoying. Hmm. <laughs> Halfway through the blaring horns. And that brings us uh, to the end of Let's Talk About the Thing. Um, 
<laughs> uh, hashtag going mad in real time. Um, as I'm not going to say as is tradition, what's wrong with me? Once more, I must ask you, what happens next? Uh, I've been dreading this because, I, as I said, I have no memory of this segment where they go to the spaceship mm. and see the thing cut out of the ice. And you may ding me there, even though it, it was sort of the thing that, that they cut out of the ice. Uh, you, uh, uh, you're, you're owning up to that one. I was going to yeah. give you the benefit of the doubt. I am hoping that this is the end of this segment <laughs> and <laughs> that we cut back to the base uh, at this point. Uh, I think that's plausible that that would happen at this point. That's a f- Uh, That's a feature of films. Uh, You uh, have a dramatic sting and then you cut to another scene. That happens all the time. Um, What are they doing in the base? uh, So I'm going to say, because I've been waiting for it to happen for ages, it it is going to be Dr. Blair looking at the computer simulation. Ah, uh, you think you think the next thing we're get, we're getting to is Blair's simulation? All right, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that's where we're going to now. I know it's soon. I know he's getting suspicious. It makes sense for this to be the next moment of the film. Uh, the only thing that makes me hesitate is that I don't think that they spend a whole lot of time at the spaceship, and it's curious to me that they just haven't gone in yet and had a look. They just kind uh, of stood outside it. Yeah, um, that is something that we will discuss further next time. Okay, then. Yeah, next next podcast. I've got a note to discuss that. All right. Well, that, that suggests to me that the, maybe we're not done with the spaceship scene, <laughs> um, and I'm very wrong about what <laughs> well, happens next. Well, it's too late to change your answer, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I've written it down. <laughs> um. <laughs> All right. And on to the next of the two important questions, who's infected? So currently, at the start of this this section, you said just Norris. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I talked myself out of thinking that Clark was infected at this moment. So I am gonna I'm gonna say no. I'm gonna move Clark into the no column at the moment. All right. Uh, that's good because he was in the no column at the start oh, of thought, this. You, uh, you I, just you just talked yourself into him being infected in some sort of frothing madness at the start of this. I talked him, uh, I talked myself in and then out again of <laughs> him being infected. Uh, but Bennings, on the other hand, for reasons that we've talked about earlier, I am going to say at this point is now infected All and right, is being we're moving. sneaky about the video. We're Maybe moving we don't... to the infection list. Maybe we don't need to watch all this direct evidence of what happened. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, just hand me that tape and a magnet. I'll sort it out for you guys. <laughs> yes. And nobody else, you think? I just, uh, at the moment, I haven't really been given any reason to believe that anyone else is infected. We talked about Blair, maybe. Um... But Blair is still going to do all of that investigation into mm. someone might be infected. Like I know that's happening very soon now, so I don't think at this stage, at least, um, he's been infected. I don't know exactly how flamethrowered blood, uh, how alive that is. Mm. <laughs> um, uh, so I don't know whether it could kind of be... I mean, he would have washed it off by this point, so... <laughs> So it's not just going to be caked <laughs> on him and later going to assimilate him. I don't think that's how it works. Um, it is It is interesting you mention um, how alive is it, because during that section we've watched, there's actually a deleted scene where Blair explains that the thing he's just been autopsying is still alive, kind of. Um, mm. I, I, we can't use stuff from deleted scenes because, you know, they got cut out of the movie for a reason. Um but yeah, it's it's quite an interesting little scene. He explains that it's like it's been flamethrowered, but it's not a hundred percent dead, and all the men leap away from it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, are you saying uh, that uh, deleted scenes are inadmissible as evidence? I I would have thought so, wouldn't mm. you? I don't know. I mean, um, 
I, I, I think so, because sometimes you get deleted scenes which directly contradict stuff that yeah yeah there there are definitely the there are definitely direct deleted scenes later on as well um relating to character deaths which are just which obviously they changed so yeah yeah, yeah so no i think i think you're right they are inadmissible as evidence we don't really know i think <laughs> generally the assumption has been that uh, when it's been flamethrowed it is l- legitimately no longer a threat yeah um, um that that makes sense to me so uh now i'm going to ask you what are you thinking of the film so far a feature of the podcast that we've moved from the start of the podcast to the end of the podcast to make more sense yeah <laughs> So, uh, like, like I said, um, the whole, all of these op- autopsies that we're having lately um, are very gross to me, uh, and <laughs> <laughs> and so the the last sixteen minutes or so, I, I would say, have been an uncomfortable viewing experience. But I am enjoying the. Um, the continued build of tension uh with starting to set the scene of what the main source of the tension is going to be for the uh for the rest of the film now the audience and many of the characters know that there's a possibility that some people uh are imitations but don't know who it's uh it's a good setup for some uh for some tension that we're going to see later yeah. i'm enjoying it I mean, and and you mentioned like you know that um, the last sixteen minutes or so made you uncomfortable. I mean, that's sort of one of the aims of a horror film, right? So, yes, um, that's true. Um, so it's, and... it's sort of working as designed. It is. Um... Won't fix. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I like in this genre is um, tension. Uh, mm-hmm. and uh, suspense uh, what I have never quite found myself really getting into and enjoying is the gross out stuff that's just mm-hmm. not really my bag I'm not like I, I, I'm not like some people where I just can't watch that stuff it just doesn't do anything for me and occasionally like in the autopsy stuff I'm like oh, this is just I don't really want to be watching this, to be honest. Um, uh, but I, but I think that this film finds a decent balance. Like I don't think it, even though what it's doing a lot of the time is very horrific uh, and very gross. I don't think, given the circumstance that they're in, it ever feels like it's doing it in a way that is just completely gratuitous you know it's it's all serving the the aims of the film yeah and it's really interesting you bring that up because um john carpenter said like at the time it was considered like grotesque frightening and repellent but now it's just considered sort of an action monster movie so yeah i I think uh what you expect from that sort of uh, film has definitely changed and that this would probably have been thought of as more extreme back then we the recently time, yeah yeah uh yes we recently i think we mentioned before that we recently watched uh color out of space which has mm. some very similar elements uh to it and i think goes more extreme with a lot of them oh yeah i i, I find some scenes from the color out of space incredibly difficult to watch i mean it's a very good film but yeah. um they are very grotesque yeah and so even though the, a lot of it is clearly in, inspired by this they go um further with it and i think probably they people feel like they have to go a bit further with it now and there's definitely mm. a whole area of kind of um films that uh just very extreme on the gore oh yeah and uh that i i have never been able to get into at all oh no i mean like like same oddly um i i watch horror films but i sort of shy away from torture porn films yeah 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 yeah. uh, you can definitely go too far i think yeah that just does nothing for me for me whatsoever because at some point 
I feel like it's not even tense or anything that I enjoy about those sorts of films. It's just kind of relentless grossness. Mm. Well, um, I guess those interesting observations bring us to the end of the podcast. Oh, what an uphill struggle this one was. <laughs> well, I, all I can say is I'm glad that I'm not the one that edits these. <laughs> Oh, you won't have heard it because I cut it out, but I absolutely could not get that sentence about Keith David's out. I don't know why. I mean, it was uh, just a car wreck for me to watch. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) uh, Cut it out and bury it in the ice. Um, (laughs) Well, I guess it's just time for us to tell people where we can be hunted down for sport on the internet. You, Peter can be found on Twitter and other services where your username is Kestrel Pi. That's Kestrel like the bird and Pi like the irrational number. And you, Kieran, can be found at at Kieran J. Walsh. That's, that's good. You see, you see we've we, done this enough times that we, we, can, we, we can swap over. We've finished each other's Twitter sandwiches. sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, good night, everyone. Good night.